Right, hello everyone, it's the fourth episode in the Sensory Ecology series. Aren't we excited? I know I am. Now, today's episode is all going to be about analysing... Oh, stop right there! Sam has signed a contract to be part of Benito's explanations. If you don't let him film, there will be trouble. And who are you exactly? I am Sam's lawyer. Sam's lawyer? Yes. Sam's got a lawyer? Sam does have a lawyer. Well, do you know what I think about that? What? I'll show you. Hang on a second. Hmm. I see no. <laughs> sorry. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, God. Oh, God. Hmm. Right, hello everyone! <sighs> hello everyone, yes, it's the fourth video in the Sensory Ecology series, and today we're going to wrap up the topic of hearing that we've been talking about for the past three videos, and quite frankly, we're all pretty bored of. <laughs> okay? So, last time we talked about the mechanisms of directional hearing using that very unique organism, Ormia acrasia, the parasitoid fly. Um, which is a parasitoid of crickets. Now today we're not going to stray far from the orthopterans actually. Orthopterans are actually very good organisms to study hearing because they have to do a lot of it. Um, but now we're going to look at it in the context of analysing sound frequency, analysing spectral information of the sound. Okay, And we're going to show by the end of it incredible convergent evolution. We've talked about um, how we analyse frequency in our own ears, with the basilar membrane being very uneven. I draw that fascinating diagram, didn't I? And how it um, vibrates at different frequencies. Well, could these phylogenetically distinct organisms, the katydids and the locusts, have something similar? Okay, well that'll be interesting, won't it? But let's focus on the locusts first. Um, they have an ear, yeah, on the first abdominal segment of their body, okay? So it's a place we haven't really looked at before, and it's a tympanal membrane. Um, it's a pressure receiver, we've been talking about them a lot, and they determine sound frequency using an organ um, underneath that tympanal membrane called Muller's organ. Now, as you know, I'm a brilliant artist, but there's no way I'm going to be able to draw Muller's organ for you, so here's a diagram of it. Okay, now we don't need to know the ins and outs of this, but basically, in the mother's organs, there are four types of cell. There are the D cells, the C cells, the B cells, and the A cells. You know, I said that the wrong way around, just for you OCD people out there, to put you on edge. <laughs> right. So there are the D cells. They respond to high frequencies, okay? The kind of frequencies that would be produced by their predators. For example, bats, ultrasonic frequencies. Um, so they'll naturally produce a different kind of response to songs called by their friends, conspecifics, okay? So they're going to elicit different responses, and that's why it's important to tell the difference between the two. Um, so D cells will send information to the piriform vesicle, and then that will um, regulate some sort of neural response from that. C cells, on the other hand, detect lower frequencies, those of conspecifics. Um, and they transmit that information to the folding body. Okay, so two different parts of mother's organ. Okay, that's how these frequencies are being classified. High frequencies go over here, low frequencies go over here. Very organised, really. The A and B cells um, transmit sort of intermediate frequencies to what we call the styloform body. So there's really good categorisation of frequencies here. It's very, very sophisticated. Now, to understand exactly how this works, we need to visualise how the membrane is vibrating. And we use the thing that we talked about last time. We use microscanning um, laser Doppler vibrometry. <laughs> Remember that? So discrimination between frequencies can be done by this idea of peripheral processing. It's processing 
by the membrane itself, by directing vibrations to that specific parts of the membrane where those frequencies can be analysed. So obviously the piriform vesicle and the folded body are in different positions along the membrane. So vibrating different parts of the membrane will allow the locus to distinguish between different frequencies. The nervous system basically has no parts in this. Okay, it's the basic composition of the membrane itself that allows frequencies to be analysed. For example, if you introduce a high frequency, well then the periphery of the membrane will start to move more, but then it will gradually move towards the centre, which is where the piriform vesicle is. Okay, so it's all about the physical properties of the membrane. The membrane isn't even. Right? It's not the same, it's not a homogenous membrane, it's heterogeneous. So high frequencies are going to go towards the um, piriform vesicle um, and low frequencies are going to move near the folded body, presumably. We also must remember that as the sound moves along the membrane, there's energy dissipation. Okay, Naturally that would occur in any system. Um, I've written some complicated equations here, but really we don't need to know about them. So for a thin plate, um, the velocity of the membrane is equal to that, and for a stiff plate it's equal to that. The one point that's interesting is right at the end of this last equation where we've got omega here. That is frequency. So we can see that there's um, the, the velocity and frequency are positively associated with each other. So that means that this suggests that the locus should be able to adapt their system to the frequencies that they want to listen to. And this isn't completely different to what we see in humans. So what we see here is that if you go a certain distance along the membrane, the wave will travel, travel, but then it will reach a peak um, in vibration at a particular point. So here, for a high frequency, it would be near the piriform vesicle. Okay, and what you get is what's called a von Beckesy wave, named after the person who discovered it in humans. Von, um, we also have a similar system. If you travel a certain distance along um, the basal of the membrane, you'll get a peak in um, vibration. Yeah, so it's kind of similar, but also very different. But on the other hand, katydids, right? They're also orthopterans. Do they have something which is quite similar to the mechanisms in our ears? Now, like the crickets we were talking about last time, they have ears on the tibia of their front legs, okay, their forelegs. Um, and these are pressure different receivers that we talked about last time, so linked to the tracheal system of the cricket, right? And these are what we call impedance transformers. I'm going to explain what exactly that means. So this is where sound is conducted from outside and then transferred into what's called the auditory vesicle, where the sensory cells are, and the frequency um, of the sound that you're hearing is sort of dissected into, if you like, into its separate frequencies, so they can be individually analysed. Now, let's have a look at the diagram for that. It's going to look very complicated at the moment, but hopefully we're going to explain exactly the physics behind how this works. OK, so let's take a cross-section then of the tibia of that cricket, because that will give us a good idea on what's going on. So as you can see here, there's two tympanal membranes, the anterior one and the posterior one. OK, and this is surrounded by an air-filled cavity because of those flaps on either side, OK? And that's because that's the medium in which sound is travelling in, OK, for us anyway. So, as you can see, for the two tympanal membranes, then, there are two tracheal systems. So there's two pressure difference receivers in each tibia. Okay. Now, if you look at the yellow part of that diagram, that's what we call the crista acoustica. Okay. Just below is the crista acoustica. The yellow bit, all of it, is the auditory vesicle. But the crista acoustica is the important bit because that's where the sensory cells are. So there's no Muller's organ here. This is a completely different mechanism of hearing. And that's interesting because the locus that we were talking about earlier are very much related to um, these katydids. Now what's interesting is that if you look at that crista acoustica, you'll see there's a gradient of cells. You'll see that there's high frequency receptor cells at the distal end and lower frequencies at the proximal end. Now that 
should remind you of something, and that should remind you of the basilar membrane, on how different, how the basilar membrane is uneven along its length, so that means it vibrates at different frequencies and stimulates different hair cells. I say there are cells that are specific to particular frequencies, but what I mean is, the higher frequencies will travel further along the crystalacoustica than lower frequencies, so they'll reach um, cells at the more distal end. Okay, and then the nervous systems can deal with that and then they can work out, right, that was a high frequency, all that one was a low frequency. And this phenomenon is called tenotopy, and it's this coupled with the mechanical anisotropy of um, the crystoacoustica, which means these cases can distinguish between different frequencies. And that's exactly what we have in our own cochlea. Yeah, the basilar membrane, they have mechanical anisotropy as well. Obviously this has evolved in completely different occasions. Mammals and katydids aren't really that closely related to each other. And, well, the, the actual structure of these is quite different, because remember our human cochlea is all coiled up. This is one big straight line, okay? And, of course, with the fact that this is obviously at a much, much smaller scale than that of um, a, a mammal, right? So, in fact, these are actually the, some of the smallest ears that have ever been discovered in nature. So this is minute, microscopic stuff. So let's try and visualise what's going on then. Admittedly, a piece of paper with a fold in it isn't the best way of visualising it, but maybe it'll come into some use later. I don't know. So, first of all, vibrations were taken around the cuticle, not just on the tympanal membrane. And that acted as a control much like how we did it in um, Ormeocrasia, just to make sure that the vibrations were due to the mechanical coupling process of hearing rather than just the vibrating of the animal itself. Yeah, I did a nice pretty diagram a bit last time. So what you see is when you look at the ear, there are two bits, okay? There's the tympanal membrane, the tympanum, you could just call it that, um, which is most of it, but then there's also a hinge, a fulcrum, it's called, right? which is there. And on the other side, you've got um, what's called the tympanal plate. And what I was found was, by doing all these physiological experiments, is that the tympanal plate and the tympanal membrane vibrate in antiphase to each other. So that means, as one, let's say, as one goes down, as the tympanal membrane goes down, the tympanal plate goes up. Kind of like that, oh, stuff this idea. And it's this tympanal plate, which is the bit that's in contact with the fluid vesicle, where all the sensory cells are. So it's very important. So what I'm saying is when the tympanum is up, the tympanal plate is down, and vice versa. The fulcrum, on the other hand, the hinge, doesn't move one bit, okay? It's the only part of the membrane which doesn't move. Now another name for it is what we call an impedance transformer. And you can explain that using a pair of pliers. In fact, it makes a very, very brilliant demonstration. But um, I've only got a piece of toenail clippers, so we're going to have to deal with that. So we've established that the tympanum has a much greater area than that of the tympanal plate, okay, as we showed on that piece of paper. So on these pliers, well, the hinge is where these two bits connect here. And the longer side, so from the hinge to the end here, that's the tympanum. And the bit from the hinge here to the end of the um, clippers is the tympanal plate. So here we have the tympanal membrane vibrating like that because sound's coming in. Now, this is what the impedance transformer does. And it relates to a very simple principle in physics, Pascal's law. Okay, the relation between force and pressure. Pressure is force per unit area. Okay. So therefore, if you apply a small force on this side over a large displacement, see I'm moving the tweezers quite a lot there, then on the other side, the impedance transformer creates a large force over a small displacement. Okay, that's basic physics for you, which you know, it's very useful in these toenails because it means I can apply loads of force getting rid of all those long toenails. It's this large force which enters the liquid phase, okay? So basically, the fluid vesicle. 
yeah, where the crystal acoustica is and all the sensory cells are. Okay. So what's important here is that at the membrane level, um, the membrane isn't really sorting frequencies. All frequencies go through the impedance transformer. Unlike in the locust, where there was filtering already at the level of the membrane. However, when you look at the intensity of different frequencies along the crystal acoustica, then we do see a discrimination in frequency. So that just shows it's here where um, spectral analysis of the sound is taken into account and it's sorted. You can do this by just simply plotting intensity against frequency and then a spatial representation of frequency can then be constructed along that crystal acoustica. It's all very neat. And here is the very thing, the spatial representation of frequency along the crystal acoustica. Now I've tried to copy this as best I possibly could from the Monte Alegre paper. This is pretty much what they showed. So what we have, we've got frequency on the y-axis, we've got distance along the transect on the x-axis. But that basically means distance along the crystal acoustica. Now presumably they went from the distal to the proximal end here, which is a bit confusing because we talked about how it's the distal end which detects high frequencies and the proximal end which detects low frequencies. And as you can see here, as you increase distance, the frequency decreases. But it's not a linear decrease, is it? The little stars here are the number of data points that the scientists took. And what they found was there's a huge aggregation of frequencies exactly here. And this, if you read along, is that exactly more or less the um, frequencies that these katydids are singing at. So that's interesting, isn't it? So there seems to be more sensory cells um, that are tuned in to this particular frequency along this distance, along the um, Christoacoustica. So this led the scientists to believe, right, have we nailed it? Have we found what's called an acoustic fovea, an area on the Christoacoustica which has brilliant sensitivity, which is optimised um, for the katydids because these are the kind of frequencies that they're more likely going to be wanting to pick up, you know, to interact with conspecifics and whatever. But then they had another think of it. Because what you've got here, you've got loads of sensory cells packed into a very small space. But surely, if you want to increase your sensitivity, you're going to want loads of sensory cells over a greater distance. Because if you have all of these cells packed in such a small area along the crystal acoustica, then that's going to reduce your sensitivity. Within that small space, you have got um, cells detecting 19 kilohertz, you've got some detecting 25 kilohertz. So if these are the cell, if these are the frequencies that you're particularly interested in, then it makes sense to spread them out over greater distances so you can have greater sensitivity towards them. So this curve should be completely the opposite. So why do we see this then? Well, the answer to that, that's where the real mystery lies. We don't really know. Maybe the case is trying to increase their sensitivity by packing more cells in that area. But hey, we don't really know. And that's the end of the story for the case you did. Absolutely fascinating stuff, isn't it? Yes, 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 brilliantly fascinating. So that's it for hearing. Next time we'll move on to a completely different sense, which is completely alien to us. The sense of electroreception. Right, God, that's kept you on tenterhooks. I'll see you next time. Aha! <laughs>